Um, well, if Ed's talk have made some of you want to raise a question, uh, ask something, comment something, now you have the opportunity to do that. I can also cold call if you want me to do that. If you want to just, just pick people out and ask them questions from your audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So raise your hand if you have some question. We have two microphones uh, available. So we have one question over there. Yeah. So when you get the microphone, please speak clearly into the mic and um, present yourself and be brief. Microphone photo. Hi. Wow. Such stress now. <laughs> How to do this? Hi. My name is Stella. I work with Housing for Students at the Uppsala Student Union. I was wondering what you said about people being smarter, being around smarter people, which brings a flow of intelligence, I guess, in cities. My question is whether or not you feel like we have a responsibility towards uh, the places that have less growth uh, when we, in a way, recruit intelligence from other places. What is our, if, we, if you believe that we have any kind of responsibility towards them? I th always think we have a responsibility to people. It's not obvious that I think we have a responsibility to places. So within the US context, and that's within the Swedish context as well, I don't believe that you know, America should be worried that there isn't more economic growth in the tops of the Rocky Mountains. And there are all sorts of, you know, places in the north of, of Sweden that I would not recommend that your government engage in massive subsidies to make sure that new factories get built there. Um, when cities decline, right, when cities once have something great and then, then fall back, there's often a political tendency to try and push very hard against that. I think that is usually the wrong tendency, and certainly we've seen that in the case of Detroit. We also saw this after, um, Hurricane Katrina battled New Orleans. There was a huge desire to rebuild the city. Now, when you looked at the way New Orleans was doing for its citizens, it was hard to really see why that was such an attractive thing, right? Incomes were low, quality of government was bad, schools were dreadful, right? In fact, the kids who were forced to move out from, this is from the work of Bruce Sacerdote, the kids who were forced to move out from New Orleans actually had much better academic outcomes than the kids who remained after, after Hurricane Katrina. Um, uh, so I think that the policy of sort of artificially propping up declining cities, cities that have lost their way, uh, are usually a mistake. Now, that being said, let me temper that with two statements. One of which is, I think it is always necessary, always necessary that we care about those people who are most vulnerable in the population. And if those most vulnerable pe people in the population happen to live in Detroit, or St. Louis, or a declining industrial city in Sweden, then we must care about them. We must make sure that they have decent schooling and safe streets, right, and basic services. But the important point is them, is not the space itself. And the important point is to make sure we're investing in services that provide them. And one of the reasons why I get so angry about the people mover is that I don't see what the heck it did for Detroit's children, right? That what Detroit needed was meaningful investment in schools, whether or not it would bring the city back. Because, in fact, that isn't the point. If those kids went on to get great jobs in Dallas because they were really well-educated, that's fine. I can live with that. Right? Now, I will temper that a little bit, that in many European countries, um, the, 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 the sort of total impossibility of reducing decline, which we see in the U.S., is slightly tempered. The climate differences tend to be much milder. You have, you have some pretty severe ones in Sweden, but let's say in the U.K., the, the climate gulf between Manchester and London is very small. Right? So maybe there's a little bit more role for that, but most of the time, and you know, people tend to be more rooted here. So Americans, you know, we'll hop on a dime, we'll leave a city overnight, go live somewhere else, it's not a, not a big deal. Europeans tend to, you know, be stuck, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're born in one contrada in Siena, right, God forbid you should ever move to another contrada in that, in that city, right, It'd be betraying a thousand years of your ancestors, if not, if not more, uh, going back into the Tuscan eons. Um, but, uh, so this fixedness may mean that doing a little bit more at the place level is the only way that you can help these guys. But again, be wary. And remember, particularly the infrastructure-led growth rather than the human capital-led growth is a really quick way to waste money on stuff that isn't very productive. Eva? Hi, Eva Mark, a professor at the, at the Economics Department. So you've been talking a lot about the US. If we turn to Sweden, I understand you've been visiting Uppsala for a couple of days. And Uppsala is the city number fourth in size in Sweden. So our cities are quite small. Would you say that these agglomeration positive effects, are the Swedish cities big enough to, to have them? <laughs> or would you say that Sweden is, with the population, it's enough for two big cities and not more? Or? 
Look, I mean, I look at Swedish cities and I see places that are very pleasant, very functional, an economy that has been doing you know, remarkably well relative to the global norm over the last 20 years. Trust me, I'm not here to criticize you. Let's, let's, I'm, here to, I'm here to learn, not to, not to, not to uh, brag on that. Now, I will just say a couple of things about that. There was a question about sort of, sort of is Uppsala big enough? Now, the, the, the usual statistical fact about these, these links between agglomeration, size, and productivity show a, a generally monotonic relationship, but not one with you know, cliffs and sharp nonlinearities at various points. So it's not that you know, you've got to have, if you don't have 3.3 million people, you're nothing. But as long as you've reached that hurdle, I mean, I sort of think it's a concave relationship. I mean, pretty much sort of, you know, uh, logarithmic that, you know. Uh, you know so, so yes, would, would Uppsala have a higher per capita GDP if it were bigger? Probably. Not enough that you'd want to subsidize it. And again, there would be downsides of that as well. Um, the other thing, of course, is the downsides of density, which also go up with, so you'd have more crowding and congestion and higher housing prices as well. So those things, those things tend to meet with one another. Um, two caveats to that that are important. When I think about those two curves meeting, the, the downsides of density are very much mediated by the quality of government. So it's actually true, even though that you have relatively low, uh, low density levels in many of your cities, I actually think the Swedish government, which I think of as being way up there in the competence of the global distribution of competence among governments, would actually be pretty good at accommodating fairly high density levels because it's competent. Maybe not quite as good as Singapore, because you may be a little bit too beholden to your voters relative to the, the Singapore business. Um, but um, the... Um, but relative to other, you know, more poorly governed countries like, for example, my own, uh, you know, it's, 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 you could probably accommodate more. The other thing that's important is that um, mid-sized cities tend to do much better when they're well-educated. And that's why, you know, I mean, and you saw all those education things. But the, the, if you look at the U.S., the sort of mid-sized cities that are poorly educated are disasters, and the mid-sized cities that look like Uppsala are doing extremely well. So, I mean, I would be very surprised if, you know, Uppsala's future does not... I mean, unless something happens to the global returns to skill that, you know, reverses all this, this, you know, combination of, of high degree of livability and skill, this is a good combination. I mean, <laughs> so the... the uh, uh. Hi, my name is Anders Steinwall. I'm a journalist. Um, do, do you foresee a future where successful big leading cities like New York, London, gain in influence in world politics compared to nation states and you have countries like the United Kingdom where London on a sort of glow on the global stage perhaps is more important than the country yeah and it is true that Boris Johnson like uh, Michael Bloomberg bears outside influence but I think that is far more to do with Boris Johnson's fairly remarkable charisma and personality than it does anything necessarily about about the um, the position of mayor of London um, the the economic power of cities doesn't necessarily go very tightly with political power in fact in many of the places of the world, cities tend to be wildly underrepresented politically within their jurisdictions. India, of course, being the current example, that is, there's slightly more than in, in the 90s, but typically substantial under underrepresentation within the powerful state legislatures of urban voters. I don't see, no matter how glamorous big city mayors are, I don't see nation states surrendering their power to cities. I, I just don't see how that happens politically. Um, cities may, you know, have all the international conferences that they want, and sometimes through the power of persuasiveness, you know, or through the power of a vast personal fortune like that of Michael Bloomberg, they may well be able to achieve results. But it's not happening because the nation state is voluntarily giving up its authority and giving it back to the, the, the urban leagues. I just, don't, I just don't see very much of that in, in the politics of the world. I don't see anything within U.S. politics that suggests that cities are more empowered than the national government is 20 years ago. They're, you know, they're often far better governed. I mean, when I look at which governments I like, I like America's city governments much more than I like what happens in Washington, in part because they're so tied to pragmatic issues. And that's, that's deeply appealing. But uh, Washington may be dysfunctional, but it's not about to cede its authority on anything. And um, so I guess maybe I kind of wish in some, in some areas cities, cities might have more, more power. And certainly I like, you know, I like a lot of big city mayors more than I like many national leaders, but I don't see the, I don't see the political reshift that's often talked about. Go ahead. Thank you very much, John and on IBF. Uh, I'd like to follow up the question um, about Uppsala, but from a historical point of view. I mean, today you talk about really mega cities, but on the other hand, I mean, when you talk How about is this, this fair, this is a great expert in 17th century Swedish history who's like asking me on the history of Uppsala. How, uh, how can this possibly be fair? No, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask you a question about Detroit, actually. <laughs> 
Because if you say Detroit was a, was a very inventive city uh, in the beginning of the, of the 20th century, I mean, it was still a small city compared to what it, what, uh, compared to the city you talk about as the booming growth uh, metropolis of today. So is that a kind of, could a city be too big? Or how big do you need to be today to be um, in a position to, to kind of uh, influence uh, global developments? Again, I mean, I'm just going to give a similar answer. I see, I see the, the relationship as being concave, uh, monotonic. There are no cliffs. There are no, there's no one right answer. You would be more influential, more impactful, and probably more creative if you were bigger. But you would also have other downsides. And education mediates that. And you know, your, your mid-sized cities are much more creative and influential when they're better educated, better educated as well. So I think, that's, that, that's, I, I think I'm going to give the same, the same basic answer, because I don't think there's a I just don't think there's any kind of a cliff there. Um. So I have one question over there. Yeah, you've had your hand up all, for a long time. <laughs> the, uh... Thank you. Um, Emma Shellblood from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, like you, I believe in the creative capacity of cities. I wonder, therefore, if you have some reflections on the decision of high-tech leaders such as Google, Facebook and Apple to build their campuses outside of cities in rather exclusive developments. Is this good for the companies? Is this good for cities? Or is this just California? So I would, I would phrase the, the question slightly, slightly. I think it's a great question. I'm so glad you, that you asked me for it. But I would actually phrase the history as being slightly different. So Silicon Valley, which is where this stuff starts, right? is the child of Stanford in, uh, University. I'm not going to get into the pre-war history, but in fact, there's a whole stuff before anything about Frederick Terman and Fairchild Semiconductor. There's a whole world of sort of Stanford spin-offs in the teens and 20s that actually ends up giving the young Fred Terman business experience before he goes to work uh, for MIT and then he returns. So he works for Vannevar Bush at MIT, and Vannevar Bush is within Boston. I mean, he's the architect of academic leaders, a great scientist, uh, bridging out into commercial enterprise as well as being a, a statesman uh, of a sort as, as well. And Terman takes this model back to Stanford. He decides that Stanford has all this creative capacity in engineering, and it has a zeitgeist of connecting with the real world, which is built into it, because unlike Harvard, right, which was built by, you know, Puritans to fight the Jesuits in the New World. I mean, Stanford is built by a railroad pioneer to educate practical men in practical things. And it has always has never lost that fundamental spirit. So Terman goes back and you know, creates Stanford Industrial Park and um, manages to attract you know, a, a great deal of talent. And then these remarkable things happen in the 1960s. And it's also attracted in part by the fact that Palo Alto is this you know, insanely beautiful place. And it's also built in car-based living, because it's built after World War II, where cars are the, cars are the, are the norm. And so you have this car-based cluster in Silicon Valley. Now, it still is a cluster that, with stories that are replete about personal interactions. I mean, Silicon Valley, and I use this in some sense to highlight the point that those people who say that new technology is going to kill off face-to-face -face interaction well, why then would Silicon Valley even exist as a geographic cluster, right, if this, if this is going on? Why then would, you know, Google, which of all the companies in the world should be able to enable people to work at home and just dial it in, why is it that they build the Googleplex and put everyone on top of each other? Now, you're right. They build the Googleplex in suburban Stanford because that's where they've been. But the move has been over the past 10 years. The move has been towards more and more urban areas, right? So Google bought a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan because it actually saw great advantages of, of, uh, of urbanization. Um, so, uh, and I think that's, that has shown, I mean, Tony Shea in Las Vegas, for example, that has shown up sil the rise in, in, Stanford, in um, Silicon Valley firms moving to San Francisco. I think the trend has been certainly towards at least some urban presence, particularly because they're young, well-paid, hip people actually want, they actually don't want to live in a sprawling suburb. They actually, or many of them want actually to be in a fun, a fun hip city. Um, I think the trend is towards urbanization, but it's starting in you know, the golden suburban car-based living of Silicon Valley. That's where it starts. That's where its history goes in. And it's not going to undo that altogether. And look, 
that's a, you know, if you like car-based living, if you like living in, you know, I, I lived, spent for a year in Palo Alto, and I, I had a, I, w- I woke up every morning when I started running, and I had an expletive before the word Eden that, that I, I started my run on, meaning that it, it, it was beautiful, and I hated it because it was beautiful. But uh, it was, uh, and it was, you know, this perfect American suburban life. Now, I may not like it. It may have drove me crazy on a daily basis, but there are plenty of Americans who like it, and they're not crazy to do so. And I don't think that model is in any sense, sense broken or going to disappear, but I do think the trend within the tech industry also favors cities. I have a question. Um, you said before, uh, don't blame cities for poverty. Uh, cities do not create poverty. Um, cities don't make people poor. Um, and this is a tough question, but what would you say, can you comment on what causes poverty? And is it possible to make dense, thriving cities, uh, economically thriving cities, with a lot of smart, innovative, creative people, that are characterized by equality rather than inequality? And what would that take? Well, I think the point is, so this is a great question, obviously. It's a huge, it's a huge question. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, good. Um, I'll just put this up. Now, the, uh, it is certainly true that cities have lots of rich and poor people. They have since, you know, Plato wrote that no matter any city, no matter how small, is really two cities, one rich and one poor. Um, and of course, the point is that New York has plenty of rich people because New York is a great place to be really rich, and New York has poor people because it's a, a great place to be poor. And there's nothing a uh, relatively good place to be poor, and there's no reason why New York should apologize for its inequality, just as there's no reason that suburbs that zone out make it impossible to build housing for poor people, and as a result, look incredibly equal. There's nothing to be proud about that. I mean, providing no housing for poor people so everyone has the same income, what's, what's good about that? What's, what's, a, what's attractive about that? Local equality, extreme local equality, we have another word for that, it's segregation, right? So inequality at the local level is not something fundamentally uh, that should be apologized for. Now, if those localities become ossified, if the poverty becomes permanent, if there's, so cities are not doing what cities have, are meant to do, which is providing some degree of opportunity going forward for the people who start with less, then there's a big problem. Right? And that's, that's why we, you know, that's the hope of cities, but it doesn't always come to pass. Certainly, you know, uh, my own work on, on racial segregation, perhaps supported by the new work by Ron Shetty on economic opportunity, certainly finds that um, those places where you've walled off particular subgroups, particularly poor, poor groups, tend to do worse in terms of, of permitting mobility. Those things are big problems. Now, what urban policies can we enact that do more to create mobility, that do more to lift up... Uh, the, bottom, the bottom half of the population, the bottom third of the population. You know, you start with human capital, and you start with skills. Um, and, you know, we, we have a series of facts about this. Uh, Pre-K can be effective. Um, Pre-K early childhood interventions, right? We've certainly seen from the work of Jim Heckman and others that the Perry Preschool program was amazing, the Absidarian program was amazing. Of course, we've also seen when they were taken to scale by Head Start, uh, for the national level, the results were less, less great. So th- those, that, those issues are debated, but you know, I think smart, smart interventions in, in early, early childhood, particularly those that will be regularly evaluated, have randomized trials, uh, are probably for the good. Um, in the US, uh, we've had some very strong successes with charter schools, and of course we have great evidence on this because oversubscribed charter schools are uh, children are admitted via lottery, so you compare the lottery winners and the lottery losers, and the lottery winners and the successful schools do much, much better. Um, so there are ways to make America's sadly underperforming school systems better, and I think that's by far the most important thing. And you know, while I, I'm intrigued when architects talk about how to design buildings that erase social inequality, I, I don't really think that, you know, I think better structures are a good thing to be desired, but I think the first order thing that actually lifts people is giving them skills that are useful. I think there are then a whole series of questions about other types of things. So one of the things that I've been working on is creating an innovation district or an entrepreneurship district in a higher poverty area in Boston. And this is very much, when you think about sort of localized interventions, Paul Romer has this uh, great division between what he calls concession districts uh, versus reform districts. And a concession district is like uh, what we have in America, they're called empowerment zones, or, or in the UK they're called enterprise zones, where you basically use tax subsidies to bribe firms to move in those locations. Uh, uh, they may or may not, I mean, I think the work of Pat Klein uh, has shown that they actually can, you actually can increase jobs by doing this. Whether or not you do so in a cash-effective way is debatable. I'm not very attracted by those. I actually don't think that's a great thing for government to do. I do think, however, reform zones 
are a great thing. What reform zones are, you have an idea, you think it might be potentially effective, so you try it in a small place first. Um, and you're able to test it as, as a result. So the things that we're playing around as reform zones are both about regulations and about training. And not about pre-K, but about training both vocational schools, training, vocational training for kids, and also entrepreneurship training. And while there are certainly both business schools and individual programs like the Kaufman Foundation that claim that they know how to train entrepreneurs, I haven't seen any randomized trials that do it, but I'm certainly willing to, if there are philanthropic donors willing to pay up for it, I'm certainly willing to, to build, that, build that stuff in. So I think actually um, a bunch of sort of, you know, smart on experimental training programs around tangible real world skills um, probably are worthwhile doing. But again, you've got to go in understanding that you don't know the answer. Right? You've got to have a program that's going to be about, you know, understanding that the answer is going to be in the skills area, but you're going to experiment until you get to it. The second thing is about regulations. Now, um, the funny thing about entrepreneurship and regulations in the U.S. is, in fact, our high-skilled entrepreneurship is fairly lightly regulated. If you want to start an internet company that's going to have 100 billion customers, no, you can't have that. We don't have many guys. 100 million customers. I, f I forget what, what Facebook puts in its, its thing. The, um, the, the, the regulations are quite light on that. It's actually a very easy thing to do. You don't actually have to go through a whole lot of hoops. If you want to sell a milk product to six people in Boston, you're going to spend a year and a half getting through the regulatory hurdles. Okay? So the entrepreneurship that poor people do is incredibly difficult to do in these areas. So what we're proposing for the area is essentially one-stop permitting, which means that we're not getting rid of all regulations, but we're having, you know, we're having just a one person that you go to, ideally one who has linguistic skills to actually deal with immigrant populations. And so you can actually, the virtue of having one person who's responsible as opposed to 17 different things is you can also evaluate whether or not this person is doing a good job or not at it. I want to sort of have one anecdote about this, that, that um, about regulations and you know, ordinary entrepreneurship in, in cities. Um, one of my personal pet causes on deregulation is the topic of food trucks. Okay, now, I, I feel a huge personal bond to the food trucks because as a, an impecunious uh, young assistant professor at Harvard, I ate at this one Chinese food truck every day for four years. Uh, so I feel like I owe the food truck industry. Um, and food trucks, of course, you know, I mean, you know what these things are, right? They're these trucks, they usually cook the food somewhere else. So it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually regulated by the sanitary board where it's cooked, but then they deliver it via truck. Now, there was this woman who became a cause celebre in Detroit because Detroit was not letting her use her food truck. Okay, now, uh, so it was, you know, a year and a half she was trying to start this food truck and Detroit kept on saying no. Now, the idea that Detroit should be saying no to any entrepreneur you know, feels ridiculous to me, that, that Detroit should be, you know, embracing anyone who wants to start any business. But I was on this, this national public radio um, show with this poor woman and me, and, and the guy who's the ombudsman for rules and regulations for Detroit. And there this poor guy, you know, he's trying to do his job, but he's got this ridiculously cumbersome regulatory structure to work with. He's getting beaten up for the entire, the entire hour. And at the end, of the end of the hour, he says, oh, come on, lady, just start your food truck. We'll never catch you. <laughs> Which is at least one approach to this. We end, or do we have time for one more question? Are we done? We have three final questions. Three final I have questions. one over there. Hi, my name is Henrik, and I have a question on growth, smart growth. Uppsala, together with uh, Stockholm, is uh, now forming a region in, in Europe, which is probably one of the growest and, and fastest uh, expanding. It's a historical opportunity for us to do something good. And parallel with this growth, there's a lot of discussions now in these cities on how the principles of growth in terms of public transportation, in terms of density, in terms of financing and, and uh, other things. My question is really based on lessons learned from other cities in, in this phase, what can we actually bring with us and take with us in this development in order to, to grow in a smart and sustainable way? What are the do's and what are the don'ts in order to be successful? In, in 30 seconds or less. Uh, the, the, uh, um, you know, I, I, um, I often say the best economic development strategy for cities is to attract and train smart people and then get out of their way. Um, but that's not a job for laissez-faire. That's a job for actually getting quality of life right. So I would say what smart growth really should be about is how to figure out how to accommodate more density that, that occurs in a way that is respectful of providing good quality of life for, for anyone. So it's enabling 
you know, enough freedom in terms of the build, building codes for people to provide you know, dense, dense densification. Um, it's making sure that you have smart policies in place, like congestion pricing, as you have in Stockholm, that make it easier to, for people to live. It means not subsidizing transportation, not, uh, and I'm not thinking of any particular Swedish project right now, but not building highways, for example, that are being financed with general tax revenues rather than financed with user fees. Um, it means about often in the case of infrastructure, uh, being focused on a user fee based, based spending, but not always. In the case of infrastructure that particularly targets the poor, particularly buses, some degree of subsidy is surely appropriate. To the extent to which you can recognize the fact that you won't know exactly where the city will end up, right? Making sure that your investments are more flexible is really crucial. There's an old joke which has some truth in it, but not, not, you know, not every bit of truth, that 40 years of transportation economics at Harvard University can be boiled down to four words. Bus good, train bad. Now, uh, that's of course nonsense in some, in some level. Trains are really good for moving coal and other stuff like that. But, uh, and trains are certainly very joyful for, for many of us to travel in. But they are, they are quite expensive. But um, that may not be as much of an issue for a rich country like Sweden as when you're thinking about an unpredictable growth pattern. Trains are really fixed. Buses are beautifully not so. Right? And part of the beauty of, of a bus is you can, you know, you can run it down an, an open road, particularly if you have, a, and we're talking about buses on dedicated lanes, but a bus on a dedicated lane can move pretty darn quickly, but you can also take the bus off the dedicated lane and do something else with the dedicated lane in a way that once you've got that rail infrastructure, that's, that's, fixed, that's fixed forever. Um, in terms of, uh, oh, that's all. I've got three questions and we're running out of time. I, I, I can, we can talk afterwards, but this is, it's great that you're doing this. Thank you for thinking about, about smart growth, but you know, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a huge topic, but um, yes. <coughs> okay, uh, Roger Andersson, uh, geographer, IBF, we met. Yes. Um, you alluded to Jane Jacobs in your talk. I was going to put a question on a, a later work by her, Cities in the Wealth cities and the wealth of nations, which ends up with, a, I think, at least superficially, rather similar conclusion. It is cities that is driving the economies. Uh, Adam Smith was wrong in that sense, focusing on the nations. It is the cities, you should understand, and their role in the economy. So I guess you, you, you might agree with her on that point. But I, I agree with, with her, I don't agree with your characterization on Smith, but I'll come back to that in a second. But the, the, uh, the, okay, okay, okay. The, the, uh, oh, but that, that goes back into the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> you may comment on that as well. But I think uh, Jane Jacobs' uh, book on the cities, she, uh, she identified um, import substitution as a very crucial element in the economy. So cities actually copy of people in the city, copy what goes on in other cities, and that is they kind of try to substitute. Instead of importing, they try to produce it themselves. So what's your comment on that? And do, do you see any kind of truth in this particular? Sure, I mean, I, I think cities are always copying stuff from other cities as well, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. It feels more right about, about manufacturing, perhaps, than services, but oh, surely there's some in services as well. And of course, the heart of most modern cities is in the service, service economy. Not just, you know, obviously, there's some services that's going on to local residents, uh, and that's particularly important for the less skilled members of the city, but obviously those service industries are also export industries, right? I mean, that finance insurance is technically referred to as the financial services industry, and that's providing services elsewhere. Um, if you think about the success of a city like Singapore, um, yeah, there's a lot of imitation that went on in the early days, much less so now. I mean, there's a lot more now that's just pushing on the cutting edge. I mean, Singapore is a funny case in particular because it, it in some sense, Lee Kuan Yew managed this process of imitation and he engaged in very heavy industrial policy. I, I actually think it worked both because Singapore is just a very, was just a very well-run place, but also because what industrial policy ended up being was human capital policy. What he actually did was he sort of moved people through this hierarchy of you know, human capital intensive jobs and um, you know, move them from light manufacturing up to, up to other industries. Now, that doesn't mean, I mean, it worked in his case and maybe there are a few other governments in the world that can do that. Uh, I'm not sure that I would trust, I certainly wouldn't trust my government to try and do that because it would have guys doing really, do, doing stuff that would depreciate human capital rather than the other way around. Um, 
But um, the, um, the, the, I think it goes on, but I think it's, I think I wouldn't overstate it as being the lion's share of what's, what's going on. Now, the fun part of our disagreement, which, which wasn't really a disagreement at all, but the Adam, the Adam Smith point is, um, so Adam Smith is urban economics is not quite as well worked out as Alfred Marshall. So Marshall, who I lied, it really is. There, most of the core ideas in modern urban economics are actually in uh, Marshall's principles. But Smith, of course, is, does have a strong urban, urban line, and it really comes from his emphasis on the division of labor, right? Um, and he sees the division of labor, the fact that we make products uh, with multiple people putting in little bits, like his, his pin factor as being the linchpin of economic productivity. It's hard in the 21st century to share that degree of enthusiasm for the division of labor, although the division of labor is part of getting us where we are here. But when we think about further success for cities, we don't really think that the division of labor is likely to be the, the margin in which we're going to succeed in that. But let's not forget Smith's core statement on the division of labor, right? That in the highlands of, of Scotland, every farmer must be his own butcher, baker, and brewer, right? And he was emphasizing the fact that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. And that, in fact, it is in cities that you have the division of labor, that you have specialization. And that's actually still true. Right? That actually hasn't gone away. And you see this particularly in services, where you go through any big city, right, and you know, it's filled with people doing a whole variety of uh, arcane occupations, whereas in more suburban areas, you don't, you, know, you don't see that. I mean, or to take another example, you know, uh, in, in suburbs, people do their own nails. Right? In New York City, apparently, that's all sold out, or at least based on the density of nail parlors that I see walking down 2nd Avenue in New York City. There, there's, a, there's a clear division of, division of labor there. Same thing with, with restaurants as well. But, so I, I think Smith was more pro-cities, uh, but, but one last one last. Yeah, comment. well, I realize now we are running on minus time, but I, okay. since I promised Mikael to raise a Sorry, question, be, a brief question and a brief I'll answer. just give a yes-no answer to this one, okay? <laughs> that's the, yeah. Okay, so my question concerns skyscrapers. Many years ago, I heard that you build skyscrapers because land is very expensive and that skyscrapers are expensive to build. But now, after your talk and some uh, scattered uh, observations through my traveling, I, I start to think, do you build skyscrapers just to get together? And it's so quick to get up and down, as you say, in elevators, rather than building, say, the globe that we have in Stockholm. Or, or vast buildings. So when, I, when you go to Denver, for instance, you see, as you say, there are an enormous amount of land, and then there are some skyscrapers. I mean, why do you do things like that? Should we build skyscrapers in Uppsala? Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, uh, Quick you, comment. <laughs> re remember, remember, you can get people. I mean, the Googleplex also works. The Googleplex isn't that high. You can get people together if it's long or round on the ground as well. You don't need to turn them vertically to get them next to each other. The normal solution when you needed to get guys close to each other and land is really cheap is to put it flat rather than to put it up. So I'm actually with the team that says that like you only build up. And remember, those prices of building up get a lot higher than building flat, that you only build up when indeed it's, it's expensive to, to, to build so. Now, there may be cases in which people have decided that's not the case, but I think it's fairly, fairly rare that that's the case. And I just want to highlight again, and this is a sort of a central point. Um, I'm not arguing that everyone should live or work in a skyscraper. I'm not arguing that everyone should live or work in a city. I'm arguing for choices. I'm arguing for freedom. I'm arguing for less restrictions on building up. I believe that successful cities are archipelagos of neighborhoods that give people options. I believe that successful countries likewise are ones that fundamentally practice spatial neutrality, that don't put their finger on the, on the lever that push people towards cities or away from cities, right? The point is, you know, the point is, is to give people choices. Um, in the case of the U.S., Right? The, there, I talked all, already about cities that make it too difficult to build up. The U.S. also has a terrible system of urban public schools that pushes too many parents to leave urban areas to move elsewhere. The U.S. subsidizes people to drive long distance, as, and it subsidizes home ownership. Right? Home ownership might seem to be spatially neutral, but it's not because of the enormous correlation between structure type and ownership type. More than 85% of single-family detached houses are owner-occupied, more than 85% of rental units, more than 85% of multi unit dwellings are rented, and there's surely good agency reasons to, to have that. If you're going to act as if home ownership is the only way to be a proper American, you're basically saying, get out of your urban apartments and move to a suburban home. Right? 
this, this is not, you know, this makes no sense to me, not given the economic productivity that are, that are in cities. So, again, with skyscrapers, I think it's a great, I think we should actually go to some of these suburban skyscrapers and try and figure out that what's actually going on. That's the, that's the answer. But I think the, the, the key point that I want to end with is, you know, I think cities are great. I think they have a lot to, to give us. But this is not about pushing one way of living or one way of working. This is just about more sensible policies that don't artificially restrict cities or push the deck against living in them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matt.